Wave particle duality. In other words, waves act like particles and particles act like waves as well. The main piece of evidence for the particle nature of light is obviously the photoelectric effect, because if it was just the wave theory that was true, then electrons could be emitted at any frequency and it wouldn't be instantaneous either. Uh, the main piece of evidence for the wave nature of particles is electron diffraction, which I've covered in another video. But some of these ideas were pretty contentious at the time, even though we accept them now. Newton loved particles, he hated waves, and he thought that he could explain refraction by talking about a particle coming in like so, and then it reaches a more dense medium, and as it crosses that boundary, it's accelerated by the more dense material here. So he thought that he could explain it using particles. It was Christian Huygens, or Huygens, Dutch physicist, who claimed that actually no light acts like a wave because of diffraction. You can't explain diffraction using a particle model. Newton's theory of his corpuscles of light was ultimately flawed because he thought that these little bits of light traveling along had mass. But he was kind of right because, well, we now know that light exists in quanta as well and that is photons, but they are very different and act very differently to what Newton theorized. Both Newton and Huygens came up with their theories, but it took a long time for Huygens to convince everybody that his theory was right because, hey, it was Isaac Newton, and Isaac Newton was a pretty important physicist. Just goes to show that you can't really trust the scientist, you have gotta trust the evidence that you see before you. Newton, however, could explain reflection using his idea of corpuscles because, well, we know that's what particles do. It was James Clerk Maxwell who really started to find out a lot about the wave nature of light. He noticed that when he had a piece of wire with a changing electric field, that produced a changing magnetic field, and then that changing magnetic field could create a changing electric field as well. So he knew that the two things, electric fields and magnetic fields, were intrinsically linked. And he theorized, and later proved, that light has to be made up of two waves an oscillating magnetic field and an electric field oscillating perpendicular 90 degrees to each other. And because he did a lot of work with electric fields and magnetic fields, he knew how well magnetic fields and electric fields could be set up in free space. Air is the closest approximation. For an electric field, this is permittivity of free space. Magnetic fields have a similar constant called the permeability of free space. What he found is that if you combine these two constants together and take one over the square root of the permeability times the permittivity of free space, it comes out as three times 10 to the eight meters per second. That's right, we found C, the speed of light in free space in a vacuum by using these two constants. Kurtz was the first one to measure the wavelength and frequency of EM waves. That's why the unit for frequency is named after him. What he had was a very high PD applied across two little balls like that. And what did he see happen? He saw a spark being produced. What he had then was a loop like so, and he saw a spark being produced across the gap there as well. That showed him that we obviously have waves that are traveling from one to the other. Now the waves responsible for this couldn't have been visible light because they could go through some objects. He called these radio waves. Incidentally, if we're thinking about this in terms of magnetic fields, then we have an oscillating magnetic field with the EM wave. And so that means that we get an EMF being induced in the loop on the other side. So how did he measure the wavelength of these waves? Well, he did it using standing waves. What he did was have a metal sheet that reflected the waves back. And when it was just at the right position, he found that he could move this detecting loop back and forth. And when there were no sparks, he was obviously at a node. Moving it along and then measuring the distance between the nodes, he could find out the wavelength of his radio waves. Knowing the speed as well, he could find out the frequency. He also had another type of detector, which consisted of two pits of metal called a dipole. Then this was connected to a small gap where a spark could be produced. What he found, what he found was when the dipole was like this, he had a spark being produced across the gap connected to it. But when he turned it through 90 degrees, 
there were no sparks produced, which proved the transverse nature of these waves, because it meant that the waves being produced to begin with had to be polarized. So there are two types of microscopes that make the most of the fact that electrons act like waves as well as particles. The first one is a TEM, or a transmission electron microscope. What we have is an electron gun, as per usual, and we fire electrons downwards. Now the problem is with the electrons is that they actually uh, go out at, uh, at an angle. They're not going to go in a perfectly straight line. But we do want them to, whenever they hit whatever sample we're looking at, to go in a straight line. So we have these lenses, quote unquote, here. But the problem is they can't be glass because, well, it's electrons, isn't it? So these are actually magnetic lenses. What they do is that if electrons go closer to this magnetic lens, then they're going to be deflected more. Ones that don't go as far don't. So actually what they do is focus the electrons where we want them to go. And uh, after these first set of lenses, the electrons go straight down in a nice straight line to our sample, a very thin sample. Now with your sample where it's thick and you've got have lots of atoms, then you have few electrons transmitted. In other words, let through, passing through. Where it's thin, you have lots of electrons transmitted. Now, when we're talking about samples, we are talking about some very, very small things. We are talking about being able to see atoms and molecules. If we use light, the wavelength of light is way, way too big for us to use it to see such small things. So that's why we have to use electrons traveling at speed. Problem is, is that the electrons, when they pass through here, they are gonna be diffracted in all sorts of different directions because hey, electrons act like waves as well, as we found out. So we're gonna get some diffraction, but we don't want that to happen because otherwise we're gonna end up with a fuzzy image when we get to the bottom. And here's our screen here. It's a phosphorescent screen. So when electrons hit it, just like an old TV, electrons hit it, it lights up. Not many electrons hit a part of this screen, then it's gonna stay dark. It could also just be a photographic film. So to counteract this, we have uh, another set of lenses to again deflect the electrons. So the electrons from each part of the sample end up at the same point on the screen. And we do have one more set of lenses there as well, just to flip the image as it were and to project it onto the screen. We're gonna forget about this last set of uh, lenses here. So let's just look at this point here on the sample. We want these electrons to end up here by the time they reach this lens here. So you do have some electrons that will just go straight there. You will have other electrons that get diffracted and they will go this way. But we have the lenses to compensate. The more they go towards the magnetic field, the magnetic lens, they're gonna get deflected back to where they're supposed to be. So that's how we end up with a relatively high resolution picture on the screen. If it wasn't for these lenses, we'd end up with a really fuzzy picture. Now the de Broglie wavelength of an electron is going to be H over MV or H over the momentum, Planck's constant over momentum. Uh, using the fact that we know this is an electron gun, we can go straight for, and you get given this in your formula sheet, so you don't need to even remember it, 2 MeV, uh, V being the accelerating voltage. In order to get a nice crisp image at the bottom here, we want as little diffraction as possible. To get as little diffraction as possible, we want a smaller wavelength. So we want a high speed, that gives us a small wavelength, which means less diffraction. And we can say that results in better resolving power. In other words, it just gives us a much cleaner, less fuzzy picture. And we can see smaller things in the sample. And we have another type of microscope that's even better. That is an STM. That's a scanning tunneling microscope. Now, there is a third type of electron microscope as well, which we don't cover in turning points, but that is called a scanning electron microscope. But the tunneling, that's the important word for this microscope here. So let's say that we have a sample here of something, very, very small. Maybe these are atoms and we have one atom down here, so on and so forth. So we have some hills and we have some valleys, don't we? Just blown up very big. What we can do is get a very, very small probe. What we do is charge the sample and the probe oppositely. Now normally the surplus electrons on the sample here shouldn't be able to jump to that probe. But when you get this distance to the order of about one nanometer, you do actually get electrons jumping the gap. And we call that quantum tunneling. So they're doing something that classically they shouldn't be able to do if we just talk about electrons, if we just explain electrons with a particle model. This is going into a little bit more depth, but it's useful to know 
imagine you've got your energy levels here, but instead of energy levels for an electron, I'm drawing a box. And uh, then it sort of comes out like that, comes out like that. An electron is on the sample to begin with. And uh, in order to jump that gap, it needs to end up here on the probe. And uh, this is a diagram showing energy here. In order to jump the gap, the electron needs to have enough energy to get over this hump here. And we call this the Coulomb barrier. And if electrons just worked as particles, then an electron that would be here wouldn't have enough energy to jump that Coulomb barrier. But taking into account a quantum, that is a wave model of electrons, we can model them electrons as a wave bouncing back and forth as it were inside of this potential well. Now because electrons act like waves they have a probability associated with them, probability function. In other words there's a very small probability of them doing things that they shouldn't normally do. What happens? An electron can actually tunnel as it were through the Coulomb barrier and that literally is just because it always has the probability of doing that. So a lot of the electrons will just stay here according to their probability, but you will get the odd electron jumping this gap to the probe. And the closer the gap, greater probability of tunneling. That means that you get a higher current. So we can measure that current and then figure out how far the tip, the probe is away from the sample. So here we would expect quite a few electrons to be jumping the gap here. What if the probe was here instead? Can you see that it's further away from the bottom of this valley here? So we'd have fewer electrons jumping the gap, a lower current. So we know that we have reached a valley here. That's one way of doing it. We can have it at a constant height, measure the change in current. Second way of doing it is to have a constant current. And you measure the change in height that you need to achieve that. So it's almost like when you're at the auto car wash and you have your windscreen here and the dryer comes along and it detects that it needs to move up. So it tries to keep at a constant height above your windshield. Same thing here, the probe goes along and it says constant current, constant current, constant current. Oh, actually the current's gone down. I need to move it down in order to get a constant current again. And then it goes back up there. So that's the two ways that you can use a scanning tunneling electron microscope. That's wave particle duality and microscopes covered for turning points. I hope that helps. If you have found it helpful, then please leave a like and leave any comments or questions that you have below. And I'll see you next time.